Hi guys, I'm Dr. Tara Tobias. I want to welcome you all back to my channel. In today's home exercise tutorial, this is part two in a two-part series on activity-dependent neuroplasticity. In the first video, I went over what that term means and how that applies to you and your recovery. So I highly encourage you to go back and watch that video before you dive into this video because it'll make this video make a whole lot more sense. And then in today's video, what I'm gonna do is give you the 10 key components or principles that are important to be mindful of when we are thinking in terms of creating the neural circuitry or the brain rewiring that is required to regain movement after any type of injury to your brain or your spinal cord. But before we get into that, if you are new to my channel and you haven't yet subscribed, go ahead and hit that subscribe button. I provide weekly videos to help you to maximize all the benefits of your rehabilitation program by teaching you the underlying principles that are relevant to your recovery. So I encourage you to subscribe. I encourage you to turn on that notification bell so that you'll be notified every week when I post new videos. So now let's dive right in. As I mentioned, there are 10 key principles that I have taken from an article that is highly referenced when it comes to neuroplasticity and learning or how we learn new behaviors or learn new skills. And they are the foundation or the things that I am mindful of whenever I am designing a plan for one of my patients. So as I mentioned in the previous video, the goal or what we're trying to accomplish with all of the activities we select to learn new skills or behaviors after the brain or spinal cord has been damaged, the foundation is to create neural circuitry around that behavior. And this is much different than strengthening a muscle. And I know that the entire last video was pretty much around that one key difference between strengthening and creating new circuitry to learn a new skill, but it is so important that I definitely thought it was worth repeating. So when we are thinking about a goal of creating new circuitry to develop a new skill or behavior, principle number one is if you don't use it, you lose it. So we've all heard that term before, and it is so true whether you are learning a new skill such as riding a bike or you are trying to recover a movement after a portion of the brain that controls that movement or used to perform that movement has become damaged. And what this idea of if you don't use it, you lose it really means is that if you don't use that arm or that leg that was affected by the stroke or affected by your brain injury, not only will you lose that ability, but the areas around that damaged area also will degrade. So there is the potential problem that maybe a, a movement that you lost or a portion of the brain that wasn't damaged that is close to that area, over time, if you don't use it, you will lose more function or you will even lose more movement over time because those surrounding areas will also degrade. Now, along these same lines, principle number two is if you use it, you will improve it. And I mentioned this a little bit in the previous video, this treatment strategy or treatment approach called constraint-induced movement therapy is an approach where you are placed in an environment and asked to perform skills where you are forced to use the weak arm. Now, I did receive a comment on the last video of where to enter into some of these studies and people that are already trying to get into these studies. I'm not necessarily advocating that you travel to another part of the country to get into one of these studies. What I hope to communicate in this is that this idea of discouraging use of the strong arm and forcing use of the weaker arm has been shown in multiple research studies to improve overall function of that weaker arm and that several participants in these studies were able to maintain that function even after 
the therapy had ended. So you've got to use it to improve it. And then principle number three is specificity. Now what that means is that you have to train specifically. And what that means is you can train every component of let's say walking. So you can train lifting the leg, bending the knee, lifting the foot. You can get all those movements back that are required for walking. But if you don't actually walk, there will be there will there won't be as much carryover of those movements into walking. So in order to improve the leg movements that are required for walking, you actually want to practice walking. So that means that you've got to train specifically and choose activities that are actually goals of things that you want to get back to. I take this a step further in my clinic. I really pay close attention to the hobbies and the little activities, not necessarily the big walking activity, but I'll usually ask a question beyond that, like what do you want to walk to do? Or what do you want to improve your balance for? So that we can also incorporate whatever that bigger goal is or that vision that that person has for what they want to be able to, what activity they want to be able to return to. If it is you want better balance to be able to return to playing golf, then I will try and incorporate some type of swinging a golf club or golfing activity into our balance activities so that we can train specifically not only to strengthen the, the movements for required for it, but we can actually incorporate that into swinging a golf club. I hope that makes sense. And then principle number four is repetition. If you're signed up for my newsletter or you've been following me for any length of time, you know that this is critical. I don't usually just say repetition once, but if someone asks me a question, I'll say repetition, 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 because it is so, so critical. There are two things that are important to understand when it comes to regaining movement. There is performing a movement and there is learning a movement. And this is something that we as therapists are constantly assessing and making sure that we're not just getting the result of having someone perform a movement, but that we're also checking to see if they are learning the movement. And learning the movement means that when my cues are removed or when I'm removed, that person could still perform that same quality of movement five minutes, 10 minutes, 15 minutes later, even up until the next session later without my cues. That means someone is actually learning the movement and learning a movement happens with repetition, repetition, repetition. And where I see this in my practice and clinically is that people will get really excited in therapy because they learned a new movement and they want to move on to the next thing. Or they'll get really excited that they performed it in therapy and think like, now I've got this. And they won't go home and continue to practice that new movement. And so although they made that neural connection or they were able to create that neural circuitry, they did not go home and strengthen it. And therefore, for lack of a better term, that circuit kind of atrophied. So physical therapy is really, the time in the clinic is really just the starting point, but really to strengthen that neural circuitry and to like kind of hardwire it into your hard drive, your brain hard drive, it requires you, once the cues are removed, once the therapist is once removed, once all the feedback is removed, that you can autonomously perform that movement over and over and over again so that you can get to a point where you no longer have to think about it and it's less likely that you will lose that new movement. So that happens outside of therapy. So really therapy is just the starting point and actually I'm guilty of this. As quickly as possible, I should remove myself from the equation even within each session, meaning I should remove my manual cues, remove the feedback that I'm giving a patient because they need to autonomously take that over and be able to recreate that movement over and over and over again on their own. As long as I'm still involved and I'm still providing that feedback or that cue, 
that connection, that initial connection, isn't really getting wired into that hard drive. So the take home message for principle number four in repetition is outside of therapy, you need to do it over and over and over again so that you don't lose that movement that you worked so hard to gain. So principle number five is intensity matters. If you don't make the activities intense enough, obviously you're not pushing that envelope a little bit or challenging that brain to have to rewire and work. So there could be not enough intensity, but on the flip side of that, there can actually be too much intensity. And really where we see this is in the early stages, there's like a neural protective stage, and that's usually the first three to five days after the injury. You don't want to initiate a lot of intense rehab during that time because the brain is kind of going through its own healing and you kind of interfere with that and you can cause some of the neurons to actually be damage during that time. You want an activity to be challenging enough that you're forcing that brain to rewire, but not too challenging that you're going to cause damage. And usually when we see that is in that first few days after an injury. So along those same lines, timing matters. So timing the activities, making sure that you're not doing these activities when you're in that neural protective phase. So that first five days, but hopefully if you're in that category, you're being followed closely by your medical team and they will also guide you on when to kind of back off some of the rehab activities. Principle number seven is salience matters. And salience really just means the importance of something. So how important something is to you. This is huge for me, uh, more on a personal level. I know that I am a rewards-based person. Like I am motivated by rewards. It could be the satisfaction of just doing something. For me, that's important. But if I don't have that thought of that satisfaction of accomplishing something, for me, it's really hard for me to stay invested and keep my attention on things that are hard or any type of work. For you, you want to make sure, I call them purposeful activities. Always try and find things that have purpose or meaning to you that you could slowly incorporate into your rehab, even if it's just a component of something. If someone really wants to cook, I definitely want to incorporate cutting or kneading dough, I have I have these theraputties or some, you know, we cut the theraputty, something like that to encourage you to put the work in, but it also, your brain is motivated to learn that, to achieve that purposeful activity. So finding things that are important to you or meaningful to you, and even if it's just a small component of it, incorporating that into the therapy session. I find that it's extremely valuable in keeping someone engaged in the activity, holding their attention, but also learning a movement. So this is also a great time for me to just put in a little plug. If you haven't signed up for my newsletter, I try and send out a couple of emails a month on just strategies or techniques or personal stories on how to keep you motivated. Mindset is so, so important. And the reason I've devoted so much time to these emails and creating motivational emails is because I understand how hard it might be sometimes to stay motivated, but also how important it is to your rehab journey and for you to continue to make progress. So if you haven't signed up for my email, go ahead and click on the link below and sign up for my email. All right, and now principle number eight is age. Unfortunately, age does matter experience dependent or activity dependent neuroplasticity and just overall brain reorganization reduces as we age so definitely age is a factor in the brain's ability to create these new neural circuits so number nine is transference this one is extremely important so what this basically means is that performing one activity in one specific context will have some carryover. I know I talked about specificity, but it will have some carryover into other activities. So that's important because don't get too bogged down and I get this comment a lot. Well, what exactly should I do? If you are doing anything in any of my videos, because there's a ton of overlap in the activities, there will be some carryover between activities. So 
don't get too bogged down in selecting the perfect activity and bottom line and i've said this before move move if all you can think to do is stand stand whatever you do just don't sit so i hope that made sense of the transference that just move do an activity don't get too bogged down on a perfect activity and you will get some benefit that'll carry over into some of the activities that you want to do like walking which is really important for a lot of people so and principle number 10 is to be mindful of interference so there are some forms of stimulating the brain or stimulating the circuitry the neural circuitry that can interfere with other skills that you're trying to learn and this actually recently happened to one of my patients. She has some spasticity in her ankle and her foot points down, and she does have weakness in the muscles that lift the foot up, but she is progressing and she is getting strength back in the muscles that lift the foot up. She started where she trialed the walk aid device. And so she started using the walk aid, and what we noticed was that her actual voluntary movement and the strengthening that she was getting back in the muscles that lift the foot was decreasing the walk aid in this the which is if those of you that don't know it's electrical stimulation that you wear all the time and it tra it stimulates the muscles that lift the foot when you're actually walking what that was doing was it was interfering with the activity dependent neuroplasticity that was going on during our sessions and in all the exercises that she was doing outside of therapy so she was doing a great job with the repetition specificity she was going home she was doing all of these activities and the muscle was getting stronger her walking was improving and she was creating that neural circuitry when she would put the e-stem on all of that remodeling or reorganization that was going on based on her efforts of putting herself in these activity dependent situations and getting this neuroplasticity through this activity dependent neuroplasticity was being negatively impacted by now putting electrical stimulation on that so just another thing to be mindful of of course, I'm going to tell you best case scenario is that you're working with an entire interdisciplinary team. You have a neurologist on board, you have a physiatrist on board, you do have a physical therapist, occupational therapist on board, and everyone's collaborating together and that everyone is mindful of these principles as you continue to recover and return to the activities that you love doing. And that is it. I hope you all enjoyed this video. Again, if you are new to my channel, hit that subscribe button. I don't know what you're waiting for, but over half of the people that watch these videos are not subscribed. If you're watching and you're not subscribed, definitely subscribe. Turn on that notification bell so that you'll be notified whenever I upload new videos. Keep working hard. Don't give up, break things down into small components that don't overwhelm you and that you can tackle each day and know that every little effort that you're putting in right now is definitely impacting the greater picture and moving you one step closer to your ultimate goal. As usual, thank you for all the support. Thank you for all the positive feedback that you guys leave. I appreciate you guys. You guys keep me motivated. You keep me inspired. And the reason I am able to do what I do is because of you. So I thank you and I look forward to seeing you all in the next video. You all have a great day.